Hi, good day, good afternoon to you, wherever you're located. I'm Otis Toussaint, and I'm here for the uh, Office of the Surgeon General. And we're talking today during our uh, final live stream event uh, for the day. It's with uh, one of our brightest and best uh, medical professionals. Our, we're gonna talk about Army hearing, and we're gonna talk to today, Lieutenant Colonel John Merkley. And I hope that you enjoy today's discussion. We're gonna have a, a little bit of a video. Then we're gonna ask some questions uh, with Dr. Merkley. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. John Merkley. Hi, sir, how you doing? I'm good, thank you, Mr. Hussain. It's good to be with you today. Absolutely, absolutely. I really appreciate you taking the time and coming and talking with us, uh, giving us your medical expertise as far as the new technologies that we've got coming out for our Army hearing, especially in this new virtual reality, uh, COVID-19 reality that we're living in. Right. Yeah, I'm excited to talk a little bit about uh, or and to introduce uh, some of the work that the Army hearing program is doing. Uh, in this uh, COVID environment, um, some uh, well, the uh, three initiatives that uh, we want to that I want to introduce you to, um, Mr. Toussaint and I put, uh, put together a short video uh, to explain uh, some of those initiatives, and then uh, after we watch that uh, video, we'll come back and and we can discuss uh, that a little bit further. Absolutely, so, uh, absolutely, sir. Yeah, it was a good production. We had a good time. Just I, I, I got a good chance to really see the advances in you know technology that we have in Army hearing, just how important that Army hearing is. It, but before we go into the video, so if you could just talk to us, you know, in, in a quick blurb, why exactly is Army hearing? Why is hearing readiness so important? Well, you know, that's that's important to know. You know, hearing readiness. Is is critical to soldier function on the battlefield. Uh, we have done uh, studies after studies have shown that good hearing is a combat multiplier. Uh, poor hearing on the battlefield can lead to uh, you know problems. It can lead to fratricide. It can lead to you know enemy you know missing targets on the enemy, uh, and you know poor hearing actually has been shown to reduce soldier effectiveness, soldier lethality, and soldier survivability on the battlefield. So we are very interested in preserving good hearing health for our soldiers while they're in their youth, while they're the, the, you know, the combat, uh, taking the fight to the enemy, uh, so they can do that effectively and, and then enjoy better quality of life you know, later on, uh, you know, there are multiple studies that show that, you know, poor hearing leads to poor quality of life uh, later on. So we're, we're interested in the here and now taking care of the warfighter so that they can complete their mission now and then enjoy life uh, later on. Absolutely, sir. And you did hit the point there, hearing, especially a quality of life, uh, post the military, because we all will leave the uniform one day. It's absolutely important and imperative that you take care of your hearing, take care of your ears, take care of you know, the plugs that you put in your ears, making sure that it fits right, that it's well done, that it's tested and retested and rechecked continuously just to preserve you know, your quality of life uh, post, post military, especially as well. So sir, let's go ahead and transition into the video. I hope that uh, everyone gets a chance to enjoy the video that we put together, and here we go. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Andy Merkley. I'm the Army Audio or Army Hearing Program Manager uh, for the Army Hearing Program, located at the Army Public Center at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Edgewood area in Maryland. Our shop, the hearing program shop, is responsible for monitoring all areas of the Army hearing program, including hearing readiness, clinical hearing, operational hearing, and the general hearing conservation program for the Army. Uh, we also support uh, the Reserve and the National Guard. Our staff consists of acoustic engineers and audiologists, and then some technical staff uh, that support all the Army Hearing Program with equipment and uh, 
uh, technical expertise. Our acoustic engineers evaluate uh, blast exposure. They evaluate noise hazards for equipment and weapon systems across the Army and across the DOD. Our audiologists monitor the surveillance geometry and provide professional expertise to the field uh, related to audiometry, surveillance audiometry, and the clinical audiometry aspects of the hearing program. Today, I'm going to talk, uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, three initiatives that the Army Hearing Program is currently undertaking. The first is related to uh, boothless hearing testing. Uh, so most of you have had your hearing tested with the Defense Occupational Environmental Health Readiness System for Hearing Conservation, where you go into a clinic, sit down in an audiometric booth, and a technician comes and administers a hearing test. This capability allows us to take that testing outside of a sound treated room, uh, which supports uh, two primary areas right now, the COVID-19 re, uh, recovery uh, related to the reduction in hearing testing that occurred once uh, COVID struck and we all had to um, st not stop hearing testing, but reduce hearing testing uh, to make it safe. Uh, this effort will allow us to bring hearing testing to the individual rather than the individual having to go into a clinical environment and getting tested inside a booth. It can be easily administered by a certified technician in the field and we are uh, currently getting ready to train technicians on how to use this equipment. In addition to uh, the benefits that we get with the COVID environment, it is also technology that allows audiologists to take hearing testing far forward on the battlefield and conduct assessments of individuals that have been wounded or injured on the battlefield and take a look at their hearing and decide, is this an individual that uh, can remain on the battlefield or do they need to be evacuated to the rear? without needing to have a large audiometric sound booth accompanying the audiologist. The other technology that we're looking at is hearing protection fit testing. Uh, this is a technology that allows us to take a user of a hearing protector and evaluate exactly how much protection that user is getting from the hearing protection that they fit themselves versus having to you know, read a label on a package of hearing protection that has a noise reduction rating and guessing as to whether or not that individual is getting as much protection as they need. This is a, a recommended best practice both by uh, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and the National Hearing Conservation Association. And we're, we're looking forward to getting this technology out into the field to better protect our service members and our noise exposed civilians. The other effort that we are, we are involved with is transitioning hearing technician training. So all technicians that conduct hearing testing in the, in the workplace need to be certified uh, to, to conduct that testing. And that certification needs to meet the requirements outlined by the Council for Accreditation in Occupational Hearing Conservation. And that training historically has been all classroom training. So three and a half to four days of classroom training, didactic and hands-on practicum. This effort, uh, the, the Army Hearing Program is doing in conjunction with the De Department of Defense Hearing Center of Excellence is a joint incentive funded program to transition training into a virtual environment. Uh, this was approved about two years ago and was in the works just as COVID struck. And as uh, COVID-19 struck, we were able to transition our training into this virtual platform almost immediately because we were already moving in that direction. So over the last six months, the Army hearing program has trained over 180 technicians using a two-phased approach 
to hearing uh, conservation training. The phase one is done through virtual uh, means, either Adobe Acrobat or Microsoft Teams. Uh, students join the classroom from all over the world. Uh, we've, in our last class, we had students joining from Inserlik, uh, Turkey, uh, as far east as Inserlik, Turkey, to as far south as Honduras, and then across the continental United States, all joining together in one class uh, and freeing up uh, audiologists across the Army to uh, spend time doing hearing conservation related activities and not having to spend those uh, two, the equivalent of two days conducting training where our staff does that training. Then we release the students to phase two where they go on site with their practicum instructor and get their hands on the equipment, learn how to conduct uh, audiometry and practice conducting audiometry. At the end of that training, they take a standardized written examination and if they successfully pass those, the written examination and the uh, uh, practicum evaluations, then they become certified and are able to go out and conduct hearing testing across the Army. So I'd like to, to demonstrate the capabilities of this equipment. I'll first start off with boothless uh, audiometry testing, and then we'll move into uh, personal hearing protection fit testing. Okay, so the first uh, equipment that I'd like to introduce you to is the wireless automated hearing test system. I say wireless because it, there are no wires connected to this system. It connects or communicates with a tablet. So the audiometer is actually embedded in the ear cup. And the ear cups actually provide a, quite a bit of sound attenuation. That's why we call it a boothless audiometer because it provides sufficient attenuation to conduct a valid hearing test in an environment that's not in a sound treated room. Now, it doesn't mean that the environment can be super loud. It has to be done in a, in a relatively quiet room, but almost any quiet room uh, has low enough sound levels that we can get an accurate hearing test. During the test, the, the patient just watches the screen and selects that they heard the tone or they did not hear the tone. Okay, and we'll show that to you in just a minute. I'm gonna clean, we're gonna, going to clean the audiometer, or audiometer and then put it on our patient, make sure that they understand how to take the test. So like I said earlier, Technicians that operate this equipment must be certified uh, to, to uh, conduct a hearing test. So that they do need to be trained on how to use this equipment. We'll put the, well, before we put the hearing uh, audiometer on the patient's head, we'll give some instructions. So ma'am, when you uh, take the exam, you're going to tap this red button. You can see it's a fairly large red button. Whenever you hear the tone, no matter how faint or distant, the tone sounds. All right. So let me... The next technology that we want to introduce is hearing protection check. This is a system that evaluates how well a person's hearing protector is providing protection when they are using it, when they, when they have inserted it themselves and, and are using their earplug. This is important because it allows us to ensure that a, a, an individual that's being exposed to hazardous noise is getting as much protection as they need. So to do this, we present tones to the individual and they respond without hearing protection in their ears. Okay, and we look at the lowest level that they can hear the tone that's generated by the earphone without hearing protection. Then we ask them to put their hearing protection in just like they would usually put them in 
we put the headphones back on and measure their ability to hear with the hearing protector in. We look at that difference, the difference between the unprotected and the protected results to get what's called a personal attenuation rating or PAR. And this tells us how much hearing protection the individual is getting with those hearing protectors in place. Part of this test is to conduct a hearing check without hearing protection in place. So we'll fit the ear cups. All right, we're going to fit the ear cups over the ear. Make sure they're nice and snug. We're going to start the test by having the individual respond uh, or scroll down on the mouse when they hear the tone. So they'll scroll down until they can't hear the tone and then just gradually increase the volume until they do hear it. And they keep doing that until the system identifies the lowest level that they can hear. We're only going to test four or three frequencies, uh, 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, and 2000. Now that we're done with the, the unoccluded check, we'll have uh, our patient remove the headphones and uh, go ahead and put the earplugs in her ears, just like she would uh, usually wear them. Now, this is a good time to educate the employee on hearing protection devices, how to fit uh, the ear hearing protector uh, correctly. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to, to look at how much attenuation they're going to get and uh, perhaps uh, they may need double hearing protection so at the end of this test we'll be able to instruct the patient on exactly how much protection they're getting if they're overprotected, we can look at different hearing protectors that may uh, lower their protection if you overprotect somebody that can lead to communication problems non-compliance with use because of those communication problems in the workplace. So we don't want to overprotect an individual, but we also don't want to underprotect an individual uh, because then that leads to uh, hearing damage and that hearing damage can be permanent. And we want to avoid any workplace injuries. So we'll go ahead and put the hearing, the ear cups back on. Okay, so we'll put the headphones on with the ear plugs in place. and then our patient will start the occluded test. Now we're going to start the occluded test. Now that the test is over, we can remove the headphones and the earplugs and instruct the patient on their test results. So in this case, your hearing protectors are providing adequate hearing protection. Your personal attenuation rating is 20 decibel, which is right around where the noise reduction rating for that earplug is. Uh, so given your general noise exposure, you're getting adequate protection. Uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> All right. Um, so the nice thing about getting the personal attenuation rating is that now we as the hearing conservation professionals, we know that this individual is getting enough protection uh, for the hazards that they are exposed to. So we can safely say that when they use their hearing protector in the manner in which they put it in by themselves, they're getting adequate protection. So I want to thank you uh, for listening in today. We've, we've gone over two technologies that are uh, being made available throughout the DOD. Uh, boothless audiometry and hearing protection check uh, capabilities. We believe that these uh, technologies will really benefit the Army Hearing Program and safeguard the soldiers that are out fighting our wars and the noise exposed civilians that are uh, supporting our service members. We also discussed the hearing protection certification training and the joint incentive funded uh, program that's 
in collaboration with the DOD Hearing Center of Excellence and the Department of Veterans Affairs that improves and modernizes hearing technician training, makes it more widely available to a larger audience, and reduces the burden on local audiologists to provide that training individually. Also in the Department of the Veterans, in the Department of Veterans Affairs, this training will allow technicians who are certified to see patients that are already established in the VA system for routine audiometry without any diagnostics, but it opens up the time for the audiologist to do what the audiologist needs to do and opens up access to care for our veterans and those that have served in the past. I want to thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the Army Hearing Program at the Army Public Health Center. Lieutenant Colonel Merkley, Army Medicine is Army Strong. Awesome, awesome, awesome video, sir. <laughs> I know you're looking at yourself on camera like, hey, that's me, that's me. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good afternoon, and welcome <laughs> oh, to AUSA let's, Now. Let's stop. Nope. There it is. All right. So, sir, I really appreciate that video that was done there, and I know some folks probably got some questions as far as, uh, you know, that you would be the expert, obviously, in answering. So let's go ahead and pull up some of these questions that we've got already. Okay. okay. So the first, the first question is, sir, um, what is the current status of the Army Hearing Program? Well, that's a, that's a good question. So, you know, this uh, COVID situation really has affected uh, the current, the, the readiness of the Army in terms of hearing readiness. Uh, we're looking at uh, overall, uh, the Army sits at about uh, 79 percent, including all compos, so Army, Army National Guard, Army Reserves, and and historically we've been up in the in the high 80s to uh, low 90 uh, percent. So there's uh, there's a, a bit of a dip in hearing readiness related to you know the reduction in hearing testing services across all compos uh, for the active component. Our uh, readiness was up in the 94 to 95% uh, ready historically, and now that's dropped down into uh, right around 87%. Um, so we're actively working to you know, get testing capabilities back up to where they were pre-COVID uh, using this uh, new equipment uh, because you know, we're, we're now going to be able to take uh, testing out to the to the units, uh, but also you know to free up some space in the in the clinic so we can use both uh, in clinic settings and outside clinic settings to improve uh, get hearing readiness services out to them. Uh, the the rates injury rates uh, across the army stand right around seven uh, percent. Uh, for the uniformed service members, so seven percent of individuals uh, across the Army, Army Reserve, and National Guard are experiencing uh, what's considered a significant threshold shift. Uh, for the active component, uh, our injury or incidence rates rose uh, this year to right around five percent. Uh, so we're actively uh, looking at that. And, and also uh, not just looking at the, the STS rates, but looking at follow-up uh, compliance rates. So every time an individual comes in to get a hearing test, if they show a significant threshold shift on their, uh, their annual hearing test, uh, they need to come back and get it rechecked to determine if that's a permanent condition or a temporary condition. And we've seen that when there's good follow-up compliance, injury rates tend to drop because those, uh, the changes in hearing that we saw on the initial exam uh, were, to, were either a temporary condition or uh, just not real. They didn't, uh, they resolved on the follow-up. Um, so we see if, if we have good follow-up compliance, STS rates drop. Uh, so we're focusing uh, not just on injury rates, but also on uh, follow-up compliance rates. Um, follow-up compliance for the Army, for the active component, uh, sits at about 
uh, percent. And our goal over the next year is to bring that up to at least 70 percent across all compost and the garden reserve as well. Uh, guard rates are in the low uh, 20s and uh, the reserve component is is very poor and I, I won't go into that. Uh, but overall, uh, there there's been a dip in uh, hearing readiness and we are actively working to uh, improve or get get that addressed and get soldiers uh, the hearing health care that they need and deserve. Uh, one other area of readiness, our, our uh, percent of H, what's considered HRC4. So these are category four hearing readiness. Um, they, these are individuals that we really don't know what their status is. And, and that has gone up uh, significantly uh, this last year, again, related to uh, COVID, uh, to where we have uh, almost 30% of the army that we we don't know uh, what their hearing status is. And so we need to get them into a clinic or get hearing testing uh, capabilities out to them so we can get them evaluated, identify any problems and get those problems addressed uh, quickly. So that's the, the general status of the army hearing program or the army hearing uh, at least readiness at this time. Okay. So the next question that I've got for you is why exactly do we need to take so many hearing tests? You know, hey, I got a test done today. Do I need to go and take another one tomorrow, uh, next month? Why exactly am I taking so many hearing tests? You know, that's, a, that's actually a really good question and one that a lot of soldiers uh, have you know, by by law, we are required uh, to conduct a surveillance hearing test on an annual basis, and that's because we, the Army, exposes all, every soldier to hazardous noise. Uh, and that's that hazardous noise. What is hazardous noise? Uh, well, hazardous noise is defined as a steady state sound, so an exposure to steady state noise greater than 85 decibel over eight hours, uh, which you know, not a lot of soldiers go out and are exposed to that much noise, unless you're in a, a tracked vehicle or you know doing uh, maintenance and maybe working around engines. Uh, you know, there's, uh, well, there's aviation as well. Those are, are uh, very heavy noise, uh, noise exposed MOSs. Uh, but some of us are in very quiet MOSs, and our our exposure comes from annual uh, weapons qualification. So every time you fire a weapon, you're being exposed to better than 140 decibel uh, peak uh, noise levels. And so, so we have to we have to uh, monitor anybody that's exposed to that much noise uh, for legal purposes to comply with our uh, Department of Defense instructions, 6055.12, and ultimately the Occupational Safety and Health uh, Regulations, uh, 29 Code of Federal Regulation, 1910.95. So, so there's a requirement for an annual hearing test. And then if you show a change in your hearing, then you need to get a follow-up test. And DOD requires that you go through a follow-up uh, test. This is not an army, it, well, it's an army requirement, but the army requirement mirrors what the Department of Defense requirement is. So we will conduct a follow-up test. And if the change in hearing persists, then you get a second follow-up test. Usually that's done on the same day. Uh, so you, you'll go to the clinic twice, once for your annual and then once for the follow-up tests. If the follow-up tests then show that this is a permanent change in your condition, you will be referred to see an audiologist, okay, to determine is this a temporary or permanent condition? Uh, is it going to affect uh, fitness for duty? Is it going to affect your ability to do your job? We, we need to know those things because not all hearing losses are permanent. 
Uh, some of them are temporary conditions that can be treated medically. And so we want to identify those and get soldiers the care that they need, but also identify you know, what is how much is this hearing loss going to affect their ability to do their job. And so, so at most, a soldier, if they have poor hearing or a significant change in their hearing, should have uh, no more than four hearing tests in a year. Uh, and that's uh, by regulation. If you're having more than four hearing tests in a year, then uh, you might look at, you know, what are the local policies and are the local policies mirroring uh, what the Army actually requires? Uh, because the Army doesn't require any more than those annual hearing tests. Okay. So the next question, and both are connected with uh, COVID-19. The first mm -hmm. part is, uh, how has the current COVID-19 pandemic affected the hearing program across the Army? And uh, what exactly is the Army doing to uh, address the effects of the um, COVID-19? Okay, thanks. Uh, so I, I kind of went over the, the statistics or the current stats for the Army hearing program. And I think uh, COVID-19 has affected us in that, you know, we've had to uh, not completely close down clinics, but most of our clinics have now had to uh, socially uh, or make sure that they're practicing social distance requirements. So their uh, testing capabilities have been cut almost in half at most installations. Yeah, so if I had a, a, a large hearing booth that would accommodate eight soldiers at a time, now due to social distancing requirements, that booth might only fit four individuals. Um, so clinics across the army are, are dealing with this differently. Um, some are extending hours uh, so that they're open longer and can get just as many people through the booth as they could in a normal day. Others are you know, simply curtailing testing uh, until you know, things open back up. Um, what we are doing, so the Army hearing program at uh, the Army Public Health Center sought funding for these uh, boothless uh, capabilities, this, this boothless audiometer. And uh, we are in the process now of, of getting those in place. We will distribute those out uh, to the sites that had the greatest needs or uh, were identified as having the greatest needs. And then those will be, those uh, audiometers will be used in conjunction with the existing uh, testing capabilities to bring their overall testing capability back up to what it was pre-COVID, and then they will have that capability to go out to sites that can't come into the clinic. They'll, they'll be able to go out and conduct testing in those sites and then bring those test results back and enter them into the Doors HC system. In addition to the, the uh, wireless testing system uh, that, that I mentioned and, and we showed in the video, we, we are also uh, providing a limited number of boothless testing systems that are capable of conducting a diagnostic test. So this is a little different from what I, I showed in the video. This is a, a diagnostic audiometer. It sits, uh, again, the audiometer is in the headset and it's a tablet-based uh, audiometer, but it has capabilities of conducting uh, air conduction testing, bone conduction testing, speech audiometry, and, uh, and, and everything that we would need for a diagnostic exam. Um, and we'll be able to take that outside of a booth. So if you need a capability to conduct a diagnostic exam or increased capability to, to a, do a diagnostic exam, but you don't have the diagnostic booth, then you can take that system and, and use it. Um, we are also uh, contracting with, with personnel. So certain sites that identify the need for in, increased um, personnel strength to conduct these tests, um, they're, they're getting some support. Okay. So, sir, I had a question that was about the boothless technology, but I think you kind of 
answered that already. So maybe I could jump on to another question that I have. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, what other initiatives is the Army Hearing Program currently working on to help the war fighter? So, yeah, a, a lot of things. I, I talked about the, um, uh, the hearing protection fit uh, check uh, system, and that's, that's a, a, a big effort. I think it will improve hearing protection, or uh, it, it will improve our ability to identify uh, th that soldiers are actually getting the attenuation uh, that they need. Um, but in addition to that, you know, we have advancements in hearing protection that have have been made, and uh, many are, of you might be familiar with the TCAPS uh, program. It's a tactical communication and protective system uh, program that was offered through the Program Executive Office for Soldiers, and uh, the program was actually uh, defunded. But once it was when it was defunded, the the need or the, the need for that capability, a uh, hearing protection that uh, has an amplification uh, type device that when a soldier dons their hearing protection, doesn't uh, leave them with poor situational awareness. Um, that need was identified. And so currently the Army Hearing Program is working with the Maneuver Center of Excellence to uh, develop a requirement uh, document for advanced hearing protection, the tactical hearing protect, hear, tactical hearing protection, uh, and that will, if if the requirement is approved, it will help uh, bring those capabilities into the inventory, and there will be a requirement uh, for that because all things in the military are driven by requirements. And so we're really excited to be working with the Maneuver Center of Excellence on this uh, this initiative. But in parallel to that initiative, we're working with the Program Executive Office, the, uh, the Program for Head and Neck Protection, to develop a uh, an evaluated or a qualified product list for hearing protection so that uh, hearing protectors that come into the inventory are evaluated to a, a, a higher standard, a higher military standard, and approved through this, this process. Um, we think that that will help uh, bring a, a better quality hearing protectors into the inventory. Not that the current hearing protectors are, are poor quality, but this this is just a, a check on those hearing protectors to ensure that they meet the, the standards that we want, they have the capabilities uh, that we need and that are identified in the requirements uh, documents. And then we have the ability to go back and, and uh, recheck those hearing protectors to ensure that the manufacturing quality is consistent and, and so forth. Because we're very interested in getting the best hearing protector into the hands of the soldier for the job that they do. Uh, when, when we identified when the TCAPS uh, program uh, kind of uh, went away, uh, the only requirement out there for hearing protection was to reduce noise, uh, new, reduce noise exposure to 85 decibel and that was it uh, i didn't mention anything about how the hearing protector affected situational awareness and which is critical and if you're in a, a combat zone and the only hearing protector you have is a, a standard earplug that reduces all sounds uh, well the likelihood of a soldier wanting to wear that is very very low uh, because it, it affects their ability to wage war. You know, we have, I've already talked uh, in the, I talked initially about how hearing loss affects survivability and lethality on the battlefield. And then we send a soldier into battle and give them an earplug that reduces their hearing ability. Well, we know if they wear it, they're, 
lethality and survivability is going to be affected. So we can't just have a requirement to reduce noise exposure. We need to reduce noise exposure, but also for our warfighters, improve or and not allow that hearing protector to affect their ability to wage war. Now we want our soldiers to be protected, but we also want them to be effective and we want them to survive the battle. That's key. Um, so, so I think this effort with the qualified product list and the requirements uh, document with the, the Maneuver Center of Excellence will, will be huge in improving hearing protection uh, for, uh, for our soldiers. Okay, excellent, sir. Let's ask a question in regards to the advances that's been done. So the next question, uh, any new advances in hearing protection? Oh, there are a lot of advancements in hearing protection. Uh, now there, uh, there are hearing protectors for almost any job that you need to uh, perform. Uh, some have uh, the microphones in the ear. So when you pop them in your ear, uh, your situational awareness is yeah, is just fine. At least we, you know, for the most part, you can hear and uh, understand what's happening around you. Um, we need we do need to evaluate some of these products because just because they have a microphone in them and it makes it sound like you know you haven't lost anything. Our studies. Uh, through our studies and investigation group have shown that even, even some of these earplugs can reverse your ability to detect sounds. So sounds that are coming to, from the front might sound like they're coming from behind. And so we want to make sure that, you know, these technologies uh, actually work in, to our advantage. We, we want them to be, uh, you know, that we don't want them to affect your ability to localize uh, sound. But you know, the in addition to the uh, microphones, there are uh, hearing protectors now that have amplification inside. That if I'm sitting next to somebody that's wearing the same hearing protector, I can sit and talk to them, uh, and it's communicating. It takes my voice directly to their ear without any wires. We and or a radio. I don't have to uh, wear or be wearing a radio to communicate uh, with those that are within a certain distance from me. Um, and then there are hearing, te hearing protection technologies, of course, that have radio systems that you can, uh, you can use a, a two-way radio, you can plug into the uh, military communication systems. Uh, so there are lots of, lots of opportunity and lots of advancements out there. Uh, we just need to, it makes sure that whatever we purchase and decide to use doesn't adversely affect uh, soldiers' situational awareness. So I would caution soldiers about going and getting their own product uh, before it has been evaluated for its effectiveness. Awesome, sir. So regarding soldiers, what about our Reserve and National Guard? What are the what are these initiatives benefiting benefit these two parties? Right, so our, you know our reserve and National Guard. That's uh, almost thirty percent of our army uh, resides in the reserve and National Guard, and all of these initiatives are open to them. the The hearing protection or the hearing conservation training uh, that I mentioned uh, through distance learning that has already benefited uh, the reserve and National Guard. Uh, we had uh, soldiers from West Virginia and Connecticut. Uh, join in one of our courses, and then we took uh, the practicum out to uh, to those states uh, through a through an agreement with the state. Uh, so they were already benefiting uh, from that, and that in and of itself is helping improve hearing testing across the uh, reserve and national guard, and that uh, they're not having to contract out for so much testing. They're able to to actually do. Uh, the testing in-house, ensuring that the records get into the, the correct uh, medical system uh, and the readiness system that we use. So uh, that's an initiative that I think has already benefited the Reserve and National Guard. Um, the, the technologies in boothless uh, hearing testing are almost uh, certainly going to uh, 
benefit these groups in that, you know, the, the footprint that's required for conducting hearing tests will, will get much, much smaller. Uh, they won't have to purchase big testing uh, suites or a big van to, you know, drive around and do all their hearing testing. Uh, they can get their hands on boothless technology, get it out to the field, conduct their testing, and then bring it back in and enter it into the doors HC system. So I, th- I see a lot of promise uh, with that uh, technology. And then the personal or the hearing protection fit uh, checks are going to benefit the reserve and national guard, just the same as it does the active duty army. Uh, you know, our reservists, they, uh, many of them are working in very quiet jobs during the week. And then out on the weekend, they're flying, they're, you know, dry, riding around in Bradleys and tanks, firing off cannons. And we expose them to, you know, a, a significant amount of noise. So we need to make sure that they're uh, being adequately protected. And this will, uh, this is a step toward ensuring that that they are being protected adequately. Excellent. Sir, we've got two more questions. Uh, where can Army le- uh, leaders turn for assistance? Well, this, uh, that's a great question. And what we want, every installation has a, well, uh, most installations have a hearing program manager. Uh, if it's a an installation that has a uniformed audiologist, uh, leaders should, uh, they should already be turning to that individual for assistance. Uh, if they don't have a hearing program manager, then they can reach back to their regional audiology consultant. Each of the regional health commands uh, has an audiology consultant and those units can reach back uh, to those audiology consultants and get the support that they need. And, and those consultants will know who's available at each of the installations that can provide that support. And if, if they are not able to get the support that they need, leaders can certainly reach back to my office at the Army Public Health Center. And our staff is you know, wide available to uh, provide assistance to the field um, and, and or direct leaders to where they can get that support. Um, another source of, of information for leaders is the Department of Defense uh, Hearing Center of Excellence. Uh, the Hearing Center of Excellence has a website that uh, has a, a lot of information related to uh, d- the hearing conservation program across the DOD. And uh, they have resources available, posters, um, uh, video, uh, or like DVD, um, public service announcements, and training videos. Uh, that can be used, and and those materials are uh, free of charge to any anyone that can order through the uh, government printing office. Uh, so I'd encourage uh, them to, you know, if 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 they don't get what they uh, need from us, you know, check out the Hearing Center of Excellence. But we we do uh, we have uh, posters. Uh, the Army Public Health Center has a lot of materials that we've developed and videos that we can certainly push out uh, to the field. And we're, we're very ready to provide support. Awesome. And so the final question of our panel today is, uh, what is the Army Hearing Program doing to address the 2021 safety, uh, occupational, and environmental health goals related to hearing? So, yeah, this is, a, again, a good question. The, the, these goals were just recently Uh, published and kind of go back to where I was talking at the, at the beginning. Uh, The goals are to reduce injury rates uh, across the active component uh, by 3% for military personnel. So uh, the reduction in STS rates by 3% and to civilians by 4%. Now, historically, uh, we have not, we want to get those 
STS and injury rates down to 3% uh, or better, because right around 3% is where you start running into the naturally occurring hearing loss rates in the, in the general non-noise exposed uh, population. So if we get down, if we can lower our STS rates to uh, right around 3% uh, or better, then we know we, we're running a very good hearing conservation program. Now on the civilian side of the house, it's the same, same uh, process, but, but our STS rates among civilians are, are quite a bit higher. And some of that's due to the fact that some of them come already into the employment with uh, hearing injuries and then follow-up rates on uh, the civilian side are, are a little poor. Uh, so we're working on that as well. But if we can reduce our STS rates uh, by 4% in the civilian population, then we'll be right on track to where we need to be uh, as, a, as an, a, an Army hearing program. Um, the follow-up compliance is something that we really need to focus on because with good follow-up compliance, we get a good look at what the actual uh, injury rates are in the in the department in the army. Uh, so our goal is to increase or improve follow-up compliance to seventy percent or better. So we want, I mean, one hundred percent compliance would be uh, absolutely wonderful, um, but we're realistic. Uh, so we're going to start at 70%, hit that goal, and then we'll gradually improve that. I think these are very achievable goals uh, over fiscal year 2021 or uh, calendar year 2021. I don't remember if it's fiscal or calendar, but uh, but we'll work very closely with uh, local uh, hearing program managers. We'll work closely with the occupational safety and health community at these installations. Uh, we're working with our, our public health communications folks to get the word out on these, uh, these safety and occupational health goals um, so that individuals are aware of them and can, can be thinking about you know, what they can do to uh, affect a change in those STS rates and follow-up compliance rates. Excellent, sir. I think uh, I think you've given out a lot of good information today that many people can take uh, back to their units. Hopefully, they're inspired by the new technology that we have. That you know, obviously, you can provide um, army hearing protection uh, testing even in a boothless area, and of course, learning about the different uh, policies that's being initiated so that our brothers in the reserves and national guard, brothers and sisters in the reserves and national guards can also uh, receive that hearing protection that's needed. Sir, I really appreciate, and the Office of the Surgeon General really appreciates you coming and sharing your medical expertise and also an update as far as what we've got going on uh, for this AUSA OTSG presentation, sir. Well, it's been a pleasure. And I appreciate uh, all those that uh, participated in this, I want to thank Colonel Blank for for being my uh, guinea pig for the video. Mm -hmm. uh, Colonel Blank is the Army Audiology Consultant, and just a just a just did a great job with that. So I'll close out by you know that mantra that Army medicine is Army strong, and I truly believe <laughs> that. And I thank you. Absolutely, sir. Hang out in the broadcast room. I'll talk to okay. you in a little oh. bit there. And so we have come to a close as far as all of our live streams for the Office of the Surgeon General. Our Lieutenant General Dingle really appreciates the past couple of days that you've spent with us learning about the different advances in Army medicine, the things that we've done for uh, making sure that your uh, family members, yourself, active duty reserve veterans, and of course, our National Guard and Reserve uh, part, make sure that their medical care is taken care of uh, through even this new reality, this new world that we're living in. Uh, we're gonna have a survey being sent out to you. We ask you to please fill out the survey. Fill out the survey as much as you possibly can, fill it out completely, and send it back to us. That survey is coming to you. And I've enjoyed my past couple of days live streaming with you, 
And I'm looking forward to future live streams and future work working with uh, Army Medicine and of course the AUSA Conference. And as I say in closing every time, Army Medicine is Army Strong. Thank you.